Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Yes, yes. Man, they did a great job today. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you could be here. And by the way, I don't often say this on Sunday morning. I'm so focused on the sermon. But that is this. I am so thankful that you take time on Sunday mornings to come and study the Bible with me, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad to be in church today? If you are, say amen. amen. You know, the other day I came into my, um, I woke up and I was tired and I, I came over to my closet to pick out the clothes for the day. And Have you ever sat there in front of your closet and you just could do nothing? You know, you're tired or whatever, and you're just like, oh, no, 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 no. I tell my wife every morning I wake up, I roll off the bed onto my knees, and I pray, oh, God, it's another day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm so tired because I have three kids. Um, I'm so tired. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm standing in front of the closet, and, and I thought, okay, what am I going to wear? There's a pair of pants I have not worn for, for a while for whatever reason. I thought, okay, I'll pull those. I grabbed those. I, I pulled them on, and as I did, I reached into my pocket, and, and I pulled out a $20 bill that I, I didn't know I had had. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever done this? How many of you in this room, I, I, by the way, I asked that in the first service and one lady said, no! Like she was really bitter about it. I, she was really sad. But it did, like it happened. Has that ever happened to you? You pull something out, you didn't expect it, and you're like, now I got, you know, I've got 20 bucks. I'm rich, you know, 20 bucks, I've got 20 bucks. Here's the thing that you need to know. Sometimes you have more than you realize that you have. Being in the royal family provides way more than you might realize. Last week we opened up with a concept, this theological concept, that if you're a Christian, you've been adopted into the royal family. The king of kings is now your dad. And as the king of kings is now your father, you need to understand in the second sermon how to learn how to reign in your life. And let me share this with you. There is so much more to this whole royal family thing than we let on and that we know about. That's what today's sermon is about, and that's what next week's sermon in the conclusion of the series is all about. Today, I want you to ask this question to yourself. If I am part of the royal family, how do I reign in life? What do I need to do? And here's my proposition for the day. Hear it, because it's incredibly important. To effectively reign in your life, you need to learn that your power is not found in your performance. It's found in your position. Your power is not found in your performance. It's found in your position. If you are part of the royal family, you have some authority and power. But that authority and power is not found in how good you do it. It's found in your position as part of the royal family. See, this is a big mistake Christians often make. They think they have power from God if they perform their Christian duties well. Your power has nothing to do with how good you perform. Your power has everything to do in the position you hold. So now, over the next 40 minutes, I'll take explaining exactly what I mean by that. If the truth is that your power is not found in your position but in your performance, you might ask this question, then what is my position? Your position is three thoughts, and I want to give them to you, and I want you to repeat them back to me. Here they are. This is your position. You need to be able to say to yourself this, I am righteous. I have power. I am free. Let's say those together with me, will you? I am righteous, I have power, and I am free. Let's say it again, say it again. I am righteous, I have power, and I am free. Let's get to the first point. Number one, your position is this, I am righteous. You, my friend, because you've been adopted into the royal family, are positioned for absolute righteousness. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, look at what it says. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, well, let's stop and let's explain what the Bible's saying here. The Bible says there was one man who had an offense or sin, and because of his offense or sin, death reigned on everyone. 
Who, 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 friend, who was the one man who sinned and brought death to the world? Who was it? Say it to me. Okay, so seven of you know, so I'm going to ask it again. And the answer is Adam. Who is the one man who sinned and brought death into the world? Who is it? Adam. Adam fantastic. You knew. Good. Very good. One man's sin brought death and death reigned in the world. The verse goes on. Much more, that means even more than the other truth, even more important than the other truth, even more true than the other truth, much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Okay, stop there. Who is it that has received the abundance of grace from God? Who has received the abundance of grace from God? Who? We have. We, followers of Jesus. How many of you in this room, you're not perfect by any means, but you are a follower of Jesus. You believe in Jesus as your Savior. Raise your hand or say amen. amen. All right. We, listen, we have received the abundance of grace. How many of you are thankful for that? Say amen. amen. But not only have you received the abundance of grace, you have received the gift of righteousness. Did you know that righteousness is a gift? It's not something you earn, it's something you receive as a gift. Huh. That's mind-blowing. Because growing up in a religious home, sometimes I thought that to become righteous, I had to act righteous. Can I, can I explain something? Righteousness is not about doing. It's about being. Let me explain it this way. Righteousness is not about right doing, it's about right standing. A gift. Huh. I know that's hard for religious people to understand, so I have an illustration. I have a couple friends that are going to come up here and help me. I about tripped over this and died. Did you see that? How many of you saw I almost tripped and died? Sue the church, the pastor. See, that'll be on the news, right? All right, here we go. These are my friends coming out here to help me. Not Jason and Michael, though we love Jason and Michael. Incredible for our music team. These are my friends. My friend number one, we're going to call him man. And my friend number two, we're going to call him uh, Jesus. Clearly, he's dressed uh, as Jesus, right? And so now I want you to see these two because they're going to demonstrate for us the difference between man and Jesus. Man is just normal, right? Normal, and he makes mistakes, and he sins, and he's in trouble. But Jesus came, and he was perfect. He was sent by God, the Father, to reveal the Father and to redeem sinful man. He did miracles to show who he was and where he came from. And he talked to people about the righteousness of God. And then he died upon the cross to save us from our sins. But here's the thing about man that you need to understand. Man has sin in his life. This is who man is. This is who man has always been. Man is filled completely. Oh, how does this go? Man is filled completely with sin. So we're going to clothe him in sin. Now, how do we know that man is clothed with sin? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter number uh, 64, it says this. But we are all like an unclean thing. We, humans are like an unclean thing. How many humans in the room? Would you raise your hand? All right, some of you may not be. People want to see you on the way out. Area 51 is here. All right, but we humans are like an unclean thing, and our righteousnesses are as if filthy rags. It's giving the metaphor of clothing, the Bible does. And it says that we are clothed in sin. How many of you in this room have ever sinned before? That is, you've broken one of God's laws. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not lie. You've been envious, covetous, gluttonous. You've been someone who has lusted after something that is not your own. You've taken something that you should not have taken. How many of you have ever told an untruth, also called a lie? How many of you are a sinner, like Josh is a sinner? Would you raise your hand? Sure, because you're human. Now, honestly, genuinely, I don't mean to be, make fun. If you're here today and you do not acknowledge your own mistakes, your own sin, there's a big problem. Because the Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of God's perfection. There is not one of us that is completely righteous. In fact, this verse tells us that even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. I know what some of you are thinking. I'm not such a bad guy. I do nice things for people. Like I remember I bought grandma a pr Christmas present. Well, good for you. But just even your righteousnesses in the sight of God are filthy rags. That means this. Even the things you've done that are good 
you may have done them for the wrong motive, which means they're dirty. How dare you say that to me, Pastor? I'm not saying it. That's what God says. And by the way, that's what reality and rational, logical thinking says as well. Mankind is corrupt. Mankind has sin. We are clothed in sin. We have all done wrong. None of us are perfect. But then there's another, and that is Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus is clothed in righteousness. Do you understand? Jesus, while we have sin, he has complete righteousness. He's the eternal son of God, and when he came to earth, he came to earth, and for his entire life, never once did he lie, never once did he steal, never once did he say an unkind word or an untrue word. He was righteous thoroughly, thoroughly, in every moment of his life. Not once did he sin against the Father or sin against mankind, completely holy and righteous. That's who Jesus is. Say, okay, pastor, I acknowledge these things. He, we have sin. He has righteousness. So what? Well, the Bible says for those who have sin in their life, there's a penalty and a payment. And that payment and penalty is death and eternal separation from God in a place called hell. So there's a problem. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we have this clothes problem. Isaiah 61 deals with it. Look at the screen. I will greatly rejoice, says the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah said this, I will greatly rejoice. I've got some good news for you. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. You know what Isaiah says? Isaiah says Jesus Christ has taken his righteousness off of himself and he has placed it on mankind. Now, those who believe on Jesus Christ as Savior become righteous before God the Father. And Jesus Christ, the one who died upon the cross, took our sin on himself and paid the penalty for our sin through his death. So this is what theologians have called the great exchange. The sin that was on you was placed on Jesus, and the righteousness that was on Jesus is placed on you. So now we can sit back and say, I am righteous. Not because of what I've done, not because of my performance, but because of my position as a child of the king. How many of you are thankful to know today, if you're a child of the king, you are righteous? Say amen. amen. Say it with me then. I am righteous. I am righteous. Say it with conviction because it's theologically accurate. I am righteous. Yes, your righteousness, which means he is sin. No, not Jesus. Jesus can't be sin. No, the Bible tells us he was made sin for you who knew no sin that you might become the righteousness of God through him. What literally happened on the cross was that Jesus Christ took the sins of mankind upon himself. And the moment he did, the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever heard God is love. How many of you have heard this before? It's true. God is love. But as you study the Bible, sometimes you not only see the love of God, you see the wrath of God. And so we get confused, don't we? We think, what is it? Is God love or is God wrath? And the answer is God is love, but he has wrath. What is his wrath upon? His wrath is upon sin and upon sinners. And my dear friend, the Bible says that God's wrath will be poured out upon sinners. You say, I don't want God's wrath poured out upon me. You don't have to because you're righteous. You say, then what's going to happen with God's wrath? God's wrath 2,000 years ago was poured out upon a man named Jesus who was more than a man who died to pay for your sins. So what does that mean? Uh, simply stated, for those who grew up in a religious home or religious school or religious community, here's the truth that's going to blow your mind. God is not angry with you. 
Listen to me and let it free you. God is not angry with you. I think Christians live under this perpetual guilt that we feel like God is going to be, God's upset about something, and I know it's probably what I did yesterday. Guilt, guilt, guilt. God is, angry. God is not angry at you. God is not in any way angry at you because when he sees you, he sees righteousness, the child that I adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is not angry at you. I had a Sunday school teacher growing up. I loved her. Sweet, sweet girl. I saw her do this many, many times. But I remember she would look at the children and she would say, whenever, how many of you have ever uh, ministered to children before? How many of you ever worked with children? So you'll understand this. She would look at the children and whenever they were misbehaving and she would say, God is angry with you. Now you say, that's terrible. It's terrible, but it's probably because you've never worked with kids. I mean, you'll do anything. <laughs> You do anything. Just sit down and shut your mouth. God is angry with you. And so you sit there as a kid and you're like, oh. Why do Sunday school teachers, nuns, pastors, and religions do this? It's a tool of religious manipulation. Let me say it again. It's a, called a tool for religious manipulation. They say to you that God is angry with you, so you straighten up and fly right because God is angry with you. And if he's angry with you, something might bad happen to you. Friend, it's a great manipulative tool. The problem is it's not theologically true. There is no wrath of God upon you. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? You are righteous before God the Father. He doesn't see your sin. It's been separated as far as the east is from the west. He's hidden it behind his back. It's in the depths of the deepest sea. When he sees you, he sees his child saved by Jesus Christ, clothed in the robes of righteousness. When he saw Jesus, all of his wrath was poured out on him. There is no wrath left for you. See what you're saying? There's no wrath at all left for me? Not if you've been saved. You say, what do you mean by that? That means if you're a Christian, if you've received Christ as your Savior, if there's a time in your life you admit it, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, I'm asking Jesus to save me, take me to heaven, forgive my sins, you were saved. You say, but what if I'm not saved? Then you are in trouble. And I'm not joking in any way, because this exchange did not happen for you. You are still clothed in your own self-righteousness, which is as sinful as filthy rags. The righteousness of Christ is not upon you. The wrath of God is being poured on you and will continue to be poured on you. You are damned. See, that doesn't feel good. What am I supposed to do? If I were you, which I was, I would run to Jesus. And I would come to him and say, Lord, please take my sin and give me righteousness. And the beautiful thing is this. Jesus said, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast them out. So get saved. <laughs> like, I, I preach this every week, but honestly, some Sundays I'm like, just duh. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry, get saved. What is holding you back? Because those who are saved are children of the king. And as a child of the king, you can state, I am absolutely, completely, and in all otherwise righteous. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12 says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Say it with me. Say this with me. I am completely righteous, and the Lord is pleased with me. Some of you are choking on those words because you've been religious too long. Say it. Mean it. I am completely righteous. And the Lord is pleased with me. There's a lot of freedom in that. You say, well, if everybody, everybody thinks that God is pleased with them, they're just going to go out and do whatever they want. No, when I know the Lord is pleased with me, and I'm completely righteous, makes me want to serve him. It's grace, not guilt, that motivates me to serve Jesus. Number one, the thing that you need to know that's more than you realize that's in your pocket of being a child of the king, being part of the royal family, number one, you can say, I am righteous. Number two, you can say, I have power. You have, oh, friend, don't you get it? 
You're part of the royal family. You have power that you never knew you had before. You have authority that you never realized before. Some believe a lie, and I don't want anybody who's a member of our church or a tender of our church or I'm their pastor to ever hear this lie. They believe the lie that they are powerless to overcome their addictions. Addictions to alcohol. Addictions to not prescribed medicines. Addictions to drugs. Addictions to food. Addictions to illicit sex. Addictions to pornography. Addictions to a toxic relationship. You know you need to cut it off, but you feel like I just can't. Addictions to pride. Addictions to mouth saying things constantly. And you think to yourself, I just can't change because I'm just a mistake and I, I just am a sinner and this is the way it is. I have no power. Wrong. You're a child of the king. You have absolute authority. That's your position. Complete authority to rule and to reign in your life. You see, you need to grasp this truth. It's not about what you have to do. It's about what's been done for you. It's not about what you must accomplish, but what has been accomplished for you. It's not about using your willpower to affect change, but, but it's about his power changing you. You have authority. You just need to acknowledge it. My son plays baseball. He's a catcher. He's awesome. He's so good, man. I love going to watch his games. His mother's very athletic. His father is not. <laughs> so I live vicariously through my amazing son. And uh, I love watching him play. I love watching him play. And um, I remember last season, we were at a game. And as we're sitting there, how many of you know, sometimes little league parents can get very excited? <laughs> That's a nice way to say it, right? Very excited. Because, you know, the scouts are, are in the stands, Probably. <laughs> probably. And so we're sitting there at a game, and this umpire comes on the field, and this umpire is clearly, because I'm old, I'm an adult, I can tell, the umpire is like a 15, 16-year-old kid, but he's a big person, like big in a lot of ways. And so the little kids, 12, 13, 11, 10, they're looking at him, they're thinking, oh, it's like an adult, but he's not. You could clearly see he's just a big 15, 16-year-old kid. And so he comes out there to be the umpire, and, and uh, probably because of uh, some immaturity, what happened next happened. The game begins, and uh, he begins to make some bad calls. How many of you ever make mistakes? How many of you, it's okay if umpires do? No, right? No, they're not allowed. They're not allowed to be human. They've got to get it right. And so as, as it's going on, suddenly, I don't know what happened first. I think like a, the man threw a ball, the, the pitcher threw a ball, and the umpire called, Strike! Well, the entire side on my side stood up and said, Hey, no! Not true! It's a ball! You could tell it affected me. We looked around. Next ball was thrown. It was a strike, not a ball. He calls, or is a ball, not a strike. He calls, ball! The other side, no! You know, fighting back and forth. I mean, this went on throughout the inning. He kept making bad calls. I mean, there were parents calling up saying, you're blind! You're terrible! I said, Heather, sit down. Stop. <laughs> no, I'm not just it's not true. It's not true. It's kind of true. It's a little true. Relax. He's just a kid. Poor kid. He really got himself into a mess because he began... <laughs> What happened sometime throughout the game, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I do remember sometime throughout the game, there was a play at home, right? And that's always the biggest stressful thing. Poor umpire, play at home. It was a close play. The kid slides in, and the guy says, safe. Well, the crowd on both sides knew the kid was out. And on the one side, they're like, oh, he's out, he's out. The other side, it's like, he's out. The umpire at that moment did the worst thing an umpire could do. He turned around to the crowd. He said, out. He changed his call based on what the audience said. Now the audience is like, well, how about that? You know? <laughs> Changed his call. I watched over the rest of the game. The umpire began to check with the audience before he made the call. That's a bad ump. Come on, pal. It's your call. Make the call. What kind of an umpire gives authority away to the crowd? Christian, you're to reign in life 
What kind of a Christian gives their authority away to the crowd? It's your call, folks. It's your life. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, just in case you think I'm mistaking this truth. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, there's Adam, sin came, much more than with that received the abundance of grace and the gift of rightnesses, shall what? Shall reign in life. By Jesus Christ, the one. It is your gift to rule and reign in your life. Your life is your kingdom. Your life is your dominion. There is only one person you answer to, and that is your father, the king of kings. But a lot of us allow the crowd to tell us where our life goes, allows our flesh to tell us what we want in that moment, allows the devil to dictate our life, and it's time for you and I to take dominion over our life and say no. No, I follow one, Jesus Christ. Let me, let me explain the verse this way. Look at the word reign in this verse. You see the word reign? The word reign, again, the Bible was written in, originally in Greek, and the word there is basileo. Basileo, excuse me. Basileo is where we get our uh, English word basilica. It's from the Latin. It's from the Roman Empire. A basilica was a place where a king would demand a judicial ruling. This is what will happen. So what exactly is the Apostle Paul telling us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17? He's telling us that you are to reign in your life as a king rules over his dominion. You have authority in life over sin, over the powers of darkness, over the powers of depression, over the devil, and for you to be lied to and believe that you don't, here's what's happening. If you live in defeat, you are not embracing your position. This is you now, because he took your sin. So here's my question. Why are you abdicating your right to reign to everyone else? It's your kingdom. It's your dominion. Stop abdicating your right to reign over sin, over guilt, over anxiety. Just as you became a sinner because of one man's sin, so you became a ruler because of one man's death. Jesus didn't die only to give you eternal life in the kingdom. He died to give you victorious life here on earth. I'm going to say it again because that is a good one right there. Jesus did not die simply to give you eternal life in the kingdom. He died to give you victorious life here right now. And a lot of Christians stand around throughout their entire lives and they think, I just can't overcome this. I can't overcome that. Oh, I can't wait till heaven because then, then we'll have victory. No, you can have victory now when you see who you are now. The power that you have now. That's why Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, I'm going to do something here. I want to bless you. I want to throw a blessing over you. I'm speaking a blessing over you. The same one Paul spoke over the Roman Christians. Hear it. Sin shall not have dominion over you now. Doubt, discouragement, gone. Sin will not reign over you now because you are a child of the king and you need to see yourself the way the father sees you. And that's why you can stand boldly in your position because your power is not found in your, in your performance but in your position. And you can stand boldly and say, I am righteous. I have power. And number three today, you can state and say, I am free. I know what some of you are thinking. I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, 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 pastor. I get the theology of it, but wait, okay. But if I am absolutely righteous and I have absolute power, then why do I keep sinning? Right? Why do I keep screwing up? Like, okay, pastor, I get it. So I'm in absolute righteousness and I'm absolutely free and all this, but I keep messing up. Why do I keep messing up? I keep struggling with envy 
and pride and gluttony and laziness and lust and covetousness. Why do I keep struggling? Here's the answer, and it's brilliant. It's true because it's biblical. The answer is you've simply forgotten. You forget. You ever forget things? How many of you like me? You forget you have a $20 bill. <laughs> and then you show up to church. And you think, oh, thanks, Pastor, for reminding me. The Bible tells pastors they are to put their people in remembrance. They're to stir them up in remembrance of the truth. The truth is you are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer a child of this world. You are no longer a random person who wanders about this place without purpose and authority. You are different. You say, what makes me different? You're a child of the king. You're free from all of that before. See, this is what the word of God is teaching us. You say, how do, I know? How do you know I just forget? Because that's what Peter tells us in 2 Peter. I love this passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. You've got to see this. This is brilliant. This is amazing. I love what Peter says. He says, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge temperance. Have you ever gone to one of these passages? You've been Christian for a while? You ever read through the Bible and they have these lists of all the things you're supposed to be? How many of you ever, you get to those lists and you get tired? I read my Bible very seriously and I'll read it and I'll be like, oh no. Because I feel like another list, this is all the things I gotta do. Look how exhausting this verse can be. Add to your faith. I have faith. How many have faith today? Believe in Jesus? Say amen. amen. All right. Add to your faith virtue. Be virtuous. And add to your virtue knowledge. Be better know more. And add to your knowledge temperance. Better be self-controlled. And add to your temperance patience. Better be patient. And add to your patience godliness. Better be more godly like God. God. <laughs> and add to your godliness brotherly kindness. Be nice to other brothers in Christ. And add to your brotherly kindness, charity. Show love to everyone. And by the time you're done reading those first few verses, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm exhausted. How do I do all those things? Remember, it's not about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. Read the rest of the passage. And if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, these things are in you. It shows that you're in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But then read the last verse in this thought. But he that lacketh these things, okay, pastor, what if I lack these virtues and I keep sitting? What, what's wrong with me? You say I have power. You say I have righteousness. You say I'm free. Why do I keep sinning? He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off because he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. The reason we keep failing is simple. We forgot he took these things. And we are over here now. And so Peter goes on to say, stir them up in remembrance, preacher. Remind them that's not who they are, that's who they used to be. Friend, you are not a person filled with lust, no matter what the devil tells you. You are not a person filled with envy, no matter what Satan lies to you about. You are not a person that is covetous, because that covetousness is no longer on you. You are not a person who is bound to sin, that's in the past. You are a child, royal and regal, in the halls of the kingdom of God. Have simply forgotten that you've been forgiven and delivered from these things. And i got to tell you, Satan wins every time you forget the power that you have. I like taking my family to um, zoos. One of my favorite animals to see is the elephants. I love the elephants. You know, they train the elephants in India. Maybe you've heard about the elephant rope, so if not, I'll tell you. When, when a baby elephant is born in captivity, the first, one of the first things they do when that elephant stamps, stands up is to wrap a rope around the elephant's back hind leg. Wrap that rope. Then they take a stake and they stake that elephant to the ground and they give him a few feet so that the elephant can move about just a little bit, but that little elephant is staked to the ground. Now the elephant, though big compared to a human, is really relatively small. I mean, only a couple hundred pounds. And that stake is powerful enough to keep it staked right there. And that rope is strong enough to not allow the elephant to move forward. And so what the elephant does is he tries to push against the stake and he can't move and he can't move and he can't move and eventually he just gives up and he keeps standing beside the stake. 
As long as he feels the, the wrapping of the rope around him, he realizes, I have to stay here. I'm bound to it. But what happens with baby elephants is the same thing that happens with baby humans. We begin to grow. And that which was just a few hundred pounds very quickly becomes a few thousand pounds. But one of the strangest anomalies happens when you go to a place in India, as an example, you will see a large, fully adult elephant, literally weighing tons. And they're still staked to the ground with that little stake and that little rope, and they won't move. And you say, why won't they move? I mean, anyone could tell you they have all the power and the authority in the world to just pluck that little sucker away. Why won't they? And the reason is, the trainers tell us, they have been conditioned to believe they can't. They feel that little tug as they move. They think, oh, I can't break it. I've never been able to break it. I've always been staked to this. I've always been tied here. I'll never be able to move forward. Somebody could even come and say, but you've grown. Oh, you're more powerful than you used to be. Don't you know that? You're bigger than you used to be. Just pluck it up. And they would deep in their heart say, no, I can't. Because they've been conditioned to believe they are slaves. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm the other elephant in the room telling you, you ain't slaves anymore. You are so strong and powerful, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. All you have to do is say no, and you will pluck that sucker right out of the ground. Why do you stay chained to the sin and to what Satan and what the world wants you to do the rest of your life when you have every power and authority and freedom to move forward away from all of that? Can I get an amen? amen. Then say it. Say it with me. I am not a slave to sin. Say it. Not a Say it with some authority. I am not a slave to sin. Not a I am not a slave to Satan. Not a I am not a slave to circumstances. Not a As I follow Christ, I am in control of my destiny. It really is about faith. It's about what you believe. If you believe that you are still shackled to sin, I promise you, you will always be in a cycle of sin. But if you believe by faith the word of God, you'll realize that your sin <laughs> has been placed on Christ, and he paid for that a long time ago. And you are completely righteous, you have all power, and you are absolutely free, free, free indeed. Now, you might be asking yourself, but pastor... You keep saying that's true if I'm saved. That's right. You keep saying if I'm a Christian, that's right. What if I'm not a Christian? What if I'm not saved? What if I'm not a follower of Christ? Let me be very clear and blunt with you. Then everything I said does not apply to you in the slightest. I'm not being funny. I'm not trying to be cute. Here's the reality of it. If you are not in Christ, you have no righteousness other than your own self-righteousness, and good luck with that. Because one day you'll stand before God and he will judge you based on how good you did. I hope you did pretty good. You say, well, what about my power? You have no power. None. That's why you're stuck in a cycle of endless addiction and sin to everything. You cannot be freed from it because mankind does not have the power to free themselves. That's why we needed a savior. You have no power, zilch, none. You say, I'll try harder. Try, friend, try. You won't be the first to succeed. And when it comes to freedom, please grasp this. Without Christ, you have none. You are a slave to sin, selfishness, and the devil forever. That's the way it works. You say, then what do I do? You can either reject that truth and stay in your sin, or you can run to Jesus, and there's your hope. You say, Jesus, take my sin and give me your righteousness. I want to be free. I want to be saved. And the Bible tells us, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast them out. That's your promise. That's your option. Come to Jesus today. Get saved. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, one of my new favorite Bible verses. 
If any man's offense, by one man's offense, death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Let's pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world.